Hi everyone, this is Mrs. J and I'm doing a read aloud of the Odyssey as retold by Jillian Cross. And we're on chapter 7, Nausicaa, on page 120. In the land of the Phoenicians, while Odysseus slept, the goddess Athene was at work, planning his rescue. She knew exactly the right person to help him, the beautiful Nausicaa, the daughter of the Phoenician king. Athene made her way to King Elisha's palace and found Nausicaa sleeping in her room. Two maids were asleep by the door to guard against intruders, but Athene wafted past them and through the closed door like a puff of wind. Disguising herself as one of Nausicaa's friends, she hovered over the princess's bed and whispered into her dreams. Look at your room, Nausicaa. Dirty clothes all over the floor. You'll never find a husband if you're so untidy. Get your father to lend us a wagon in the morning, and we'll go down to the river and do some washing. Then you'll be ready if someone handsome comes courting. Athene knew that would get Nausicaa hurrying down to the river. And the washing pools were right by the place where Odysseus was hiding. Smiling to herself, the goddess flew back to high Olympus. As rosy-fingered dawn lit up the sky, Nausicaa awoke and remembered her dream. Quickly, she dressed and went to find her father. Please lend me a wagon, she said to King Elishness, to go down to the washing pools. I want to wash all my fine clothes, and yours too, just in case someone important comes old calling. She was too shy to mention what kind of someone she meant, but her father understood. Without asking questions, he told his men to prepare a mule cart. Nausicaa went all around the palace, collecting armfuls of beautifully, brightly colored clothes. She packed them into the cart, and her mother filled a box with food and wine. Enjoy yourselves, she said. Chattering and laughing, Nausicaa and her friends went down to the washing pools. They had no idea that Odysseus was sleeping underneath the olive tree there. They expected to spend the whole day on their own. At first, they worked hard, treading and washing clean and in the clean and clear water. When that was done, they spread the crows out to dry in a, sing a shingle while they bathed and enjoyed their picnic. And Nausicaa sang to keep the time while they played with the ball. The clothes were dry and the girls were about to pack up and go home when Nausicaa threw the ball for the last time. One of her friends reached out to catch it and missed. It slipped into the river and they all shrieked loudly. The noise awoke Odysseus. He opened his eyes and sat up instantly alert. Who were these people he could hear down by the river? Were they friendly or hostile? Human beings or gods? He was in no state to meet strangers, but he had to find out. He crawled out of his hiding place, breaking off a leafy, leafy branch to hide his nakedness, and holding it out in front of him, he walked down to the river. He was a terrifying sight. His filthy skin was covered in scratches, his eyes were wild and desperate, and his whole body was crusted with salt. When the girls saw him, they screamed and ran away in all directions. Only Nausicaa stood her ground. While the others hid in the bushes, she faced Odysseus, waiting for him to speak. Princess, he said, I see that you are brave and beautiful. If you are human too, have pity on me. I have been adrift for 19 days on the dark sea. Yesterday I struggled ashore, but as you see, I have lost everything. Please give me some rags to cover my body and tell me how to reach the nearest town. Sir, said Nausicaa, I am the daughter of King Elishnus, the king, the king of this country. Since the gods have brought you here, of course we'll help you. My friends and I will give you some clothes, and when you have washed, we'll take you into town. She called her to her maids, and they crept out of their hiding places. They chose a tunic and cloak for Odysseus and gave him olive oil for his bath. They left him on his own to wash in the river. When he came to find them again, he looked like a different person. He was clean from head to toe and his newly washed hair hung in a thick, shining mass. Dressed in the bright cloak and tunic, he was the handsomest man Nausicaa had ever seen. That's the kind of husband I like, she whispered to her maids. Wisely, she decided not to take him straight into the palace. People were sure to gossip if she turned up with such a handsome stranger. Instead, she asked him to wait a little while in the woods just outside their town. Just give us some time to reach home, she said. Then come after us. The place is easy to find. Walk straight in and speak to my mother, Arate. She'll be sitting at the fireside, spinning purple yarn. Fling yourself at her feet and ask for help. If you win her over, she'll make sure you get home safely. Leaving Odysseus in the wood, Nausicaa drove the cart back to the palace. As soon as he was alone, Odysseus sent up a prayer to Athene. May the Phoenicians treat me kindly, he said. There was no immediate answer, but as he walked toward the town, Athene herself came to meet him, disguised as a young girl carrying a jug of water. Can you tell me the way to the palace? Odysseus asked. I'll take you, said Athene. 
but don't say a word to anyone on the way. The people here don't like strangers. She wrapped him in the magic mist, and it made him invisible to everyone they passed. Then she led him along the quays and past the bustling harbors to the doors of King Alicia's palace. Go straight inside, she said. Don't speak until you reach Queen Arate. She is noble and wise. If you touch her heart, you'll have a good chance of reaching home at last. Athene left him at the entrance of the palace. For a moment, as Odysseus stood still, staring up at the massive golden doors on their posts of silver. Then he stepped through into the great hall. The whole palace was bustling with activity, but Odysseus was still invisible. He walked straight past everything until he reached Queen Arate, spinning beside her hearth. As he flung himself down at her feet, the magic mist cleared suddenly, so that he seemed to appear from out of nowhere. There was a startled silence in the hall. Everyone stared at him. He looked up at the queen and spoke in a clear voice. Noble Arate, may the gods bless you and your family. I have suffered many hardships and disasters, and I need your help to reach my home again. Bowing politely, he sat down in the ashes by the hearth to wait for the queen's reply. For a moment, no one knew what to say. Then a wise old lord called Eurycanus to broke the silence. King Alicianus, he said. You don't usually leave your guests sitting in ashes. Aren't you going to welcome this man? Immediately, the king called for water to rinse Odysseus's hands and told the maids to bring him food and wine. Refresh yourself, sir, he said. Sleep in my palace tonight. Tomorrow I'll ask you about your adventures, and then we could discuss your journey home. Queen Arate ordered her maids to prepare a bed for Odysseus. That night he laid under the bright rugs and warm purple blankets, and he slept soundly until morning. The next day, King Alicianus gave orders for a ship to be made with, and ready, with 52 young men to take the oars. This is for you, stranger, he said to Odysseus, but before you leave, let us show you our Phoenician hospitality. He organized a great feast for Odysseus and invited the whole town. When everyone had eaten, eaten the blind poet Demodocus took up his lyre and began to sing a story of the Trojan War. Odysseus was cut to the heart, remembering his friends who had died in that war. King Alicianus saw his sad face, but he didn't ask any questions. Instead, as soon as the story was finished, he stood up and stepped back from the table. You have shared in our feast, he said to Odysseus, and heard our great poet sing. Now come and see how good our sportsmen are. They flocked out of the palace, and all the young men started jumping and running. They set up wrestling matches and competed at throwing the discus. Everyone took their part, including Prince Limadeus, Nausicaa's brother. How about you, sir? He said to Odysseus. Would you like to share our sports? Odysseus shook his head. Not after all I've been through. I need my strength for traveling home. One of the other young men looked up and down at him rudely. You don't look like much of an athlete, he said. Odysseus was annoyed. I used to be one of the best, he said sharply. Let me show you what I can do even now. He jumped to his feet and seized the biggest, heaviest discus. Swinging his arm back, he flung it with all his strength, making the Phoenicians duck as it went flying over their heads. It was a huge throw, beating all other attempts. Odysseus watched it land and then turned to face his host. Is that enough, he said? Would you like me to throw again? Or does one of you want to challenge me to a boxing match? I can wrestle and run too, and I'm a better archer than anyone else on earth. How else would you like to test me? Noble guest, said King Alicianus. You have proven yourself already. I don't know who you are, but you're just the kind of man I'd like my daughter to marry. Odysseus shook his head, smiling. She is a beautiful, wise girl, but I have a wife already, and a son, too. I must go home to them. We'll send you on your way very soon, said Alicianus. But first, there are gifts we want to give you. He led Odysseus back to the palace and presented him with a bronze and silver sword. The Phoenician lords added many of their other treasures that Alicianus had given to provide a great wooden coffer to hold them all. Then they enjoyed their second feast together. Afterwards, Demodocus took up his lyre again. This time, he began to sing about the wooden horse that the Greeks had used to capture Troy. Crafty Odysseus devised the plan and built a hollow horse made out of wood. The Greeks embarked, pretending to retreat, and left the horse behind upon the shore. Triumphantly, the Trojans took it in, not guessing how they were deceived not knowing Odysseus and his men were crouched inside. Listening to the song, Odysseus saw the shadowy faces of his comrades crouching beside him in the horse's belly. He remembered those same faces lit with the fire of battle as they broke out of the horse and rampaged through the sleeping streets of Troy. 
quietly, he began to weep. Alicia signaled for the poet to stop singing. Sir, he said to Odysseus, we can see that you are noble, but you have not told us anything about yourself. Who are you? And why does that song cause you such grief? Odysseus drew a long breath. I am Odysseus, Lorate's son, he said. I was one of the men crouched inside of that wooden horse. I saw Troy fall and the whole city burn, and ever since then I've been trying to get home to Ithaca. Alicia stared at him. That's almost ten years since the end of the Trojan War. Why has the journey taken you so long? Odysseus drew another breath. Then he began to tell them the whole story of his travels right from the beginning. Meanwhile, in Sparta, Telemachus was also listening to the stories of his father's adventures. Odysseus is so clever, Queen Helen said. Once he disguised himself as a slave in filthy rags and sneaked into Troy to find out the Trojans' secrets. If he was so clever, why couldn't he save himself, said Telemachus miserably. He's dead, and there's a house full of vile men who want to marry my mother. He's not dead, said King Menelaus. I know that for certain. Telemachus caught his breath. Tell me, he said, how do you know? When I was sailing back from Troy, said Menelaus, my ships were proclaimed in Egypt for 20 days. They would still be there if I hadn't been helped by a nymph, the daughter of an old man of the sea. She took pity on us. My father knows how you can get home, she said, but he won't tell you unless you catch him. And the only way to do that is in the evening, when he comes out of the water and tends to his seals. You must hide on the beach and seize him while he's counting them. Then you must hold him tightly until he stops changing his shape. How could anyone hide on the beach, Telemachus said. Menelaus smiled ruefully. There was only one way. Four of us disguised ourselves in seal skins and laid on the beach with all the other seals. The stench was dreadful, but the plan worked. When the old man came out to count his seals, we grabbed him and held him fast while he struggled to escape. He changed into a lion and then a snake, and after that he became a panther and then a great bear. But all four of us clung out tightly on through it all, even when he transformed himself into running water. Finally, he was too exhausted to change any more. He returned to his own shape and told us how to reach home. And I asked him about all my comrades from Troy. Even my father, said Telemachus. Menelaus nodded. I asked if he was dead. Not dead, said the old man, but trapped on Calypso's island with no ship to take him home. Where is that island, Telemachus said eagerly. Menelaus shrugged. Only the gods know where. Back in Alicia's palace, Odysseus came to the end of his story. When he stopped speaking, there was a silence in the great hall. You have been through great suffering, Alicia said at last. But your journey is almost over. A ship is ready for you. At sunset, it will leave for Ithaca. When the sun sank below the horizon, Odysseus thanked Alicia and Arate for their help. Nausicaa came down to the harbor to say goodbye. Good luck go with you, my friend, she said. Do not forget me when you come home to your own country. How can I forget you, Odysseus said. You gave me back my life. If I reach Ithaca, I will think of you every single day. As the stars began to come out, he boarded the ship, taking all of the treasures the Phoenicians had given him. The oarsmen spread rugs in the stern so that he could sleep while they were traveling. All through the night, the ship sped over the ocean like a falcon. When the morning star rose, it was close to Ithaca, and Odysseus was still sleeping soundly. The sailors didn't wake him. They lifted him carefully on to lying him ashore, laying him on a sandy beach. His treasures were heaped up in the shade of the olive tree, where they would be safe until he awoke. He was still fast asleep when the ship set off back to Phoenicia. But Poseidon wasn't sleeping. He was filled with a black and terrible rage when he saw Odysseus arriving back in Ithaca with more treasure than ever before. What mockery is this? He bellowed at Zeus. I left this vile man wrecked and destitute, and the Phoenicians have made him rich. I shall destroy their ship and drown their sailors, and I'll fling up a circle of huge mountains around their city and cut them off from the rest of the world. Let them learn to fear me. Peace, earth shaker, said Zeus. There's no need to ruin the city. If you must destroy the ship, Simply turn it into a rock as it reaches the harbor. All the Phoenicians will see and fear you forever. The idea delighted Poseidon. He swooped toward the Phoenician city. As everyone on shore watched the ship approach, he struck it with his hand, turning it to stone. Immediately, it stopped, rooted at the bottom of the sea. The watchers on the shore didn't realize what had happened. Only King Alicianus understood. We have angered Poseidon, he said. This Odysseus, whom we helped, is under his curse. 
We cannot save him from that, but we can pray for Poseidon's forgiveness on our city. They made a great sacrifice of bulls to Poseidon, and he was relented and made peace with them. But every time they saw that stone ship outside the harbor, they pitied Odysseus for having such a powerful god as his enemy.